Hi, I'm Sarah Higgins. I'm Ruminant and Equine Veterinary Manager with MSD Animal Health. And today we are here on Conor O'Sullivan's farm outside Navan in County Meath with uh, Frank O'Sullivan, the attending veterinary practitioner from Pat Farley and Partners Veterinary Clinic. This is the second video in our four part video series in the March Animal Health series. So Connor, could you please just give us an insight into how you got into farming and also the system that you have here? I returned home to farm in 2015 when quotas were abolished. and um, We started off milking 120 cows. Um, over the past few years, we've built that up to about 220 cows. Um, it's 100% spring calving. Um, and we try and calve as compactly as possible in the spring and get cows to grass as soon as possible. And Frank, um, as the attendant veterinary practitioner, can, we're going to discuss calf pneumonia, but I think a really good place to start is at the beginning. So colostrum management, can you give or highlight the importance it is to get that element right? Yeah, so look, Connor well understands the importance of this. And we've recently tested through bloods, looking at Ig levels, uh, tested his calf colostrum on random calves, and it's been very good. So that shows he's got the principles right, which is, uh, three litres within the first two hours and he also is harvesting the colostrum in a hygienic way storing it in a cold fashion and feeding it out immediately so you know there's signs of it here not only in the readings we got but also in the health of the calves so Connor you have how many calved at this stage and um, we have 140 calved now after five weeks of calving okay so 140 calved in five weeks that's not only a challenge for managing the, the transition of those cows and the key for the rest of the season, but also he's that, you know, to manage those calves and in terms of nutrition and preventing disease as well. It's a huge challenge for, for you, Connor. Yeah, um, as you said, the main thing at the start is colostrum management. Um, and after that, it's getting calves penned up as quick as we can into the groups that they stay in until weaning. So, like I know on this farm and in practice in general, Sarah, one of the main challenges we have is with calf diarrhea issues and the range of things that can cause that. And maybe calf pneumonia is probably equally as important. And that's the same for Connor. I mean, uh, so he, he looks to get his nutrition as you know optimal as he can, good quality milk replacer, uh, well bedded, uh, plenty of meal, plenty of. Uh, water and um, so you know that's working well for him at the minute and we can see that from this this is not a new shed though Connor is it no uh, we've no purpose-built calf housing on the farm and um, this is one of three sheds that we use on the farm and um, we've adapted it as best we can for the job but it's it's far from perfect yeah. so this shed here Connor that we have behind us that you've adapted into the calf shed how many are currently housed there's about 60 calves in the shed at the minute and um, that seems fine at now as the calves are small, but as they grow, it will uh, it'll start to become slightly overstocked um, as the calves get older. And will you, what's your plan then? Will you move to other sheds or do you uh, maintain these groups as they are? We maintain these groups as we are. Uh, what we might do is take one of the groups out and find uh, alternative calf sheds for them around the farm. Um, but we, we'll try and maintain the groups as they are and possibly give them a slightly more space as best we can. I just as well, uh, Frank just mentioned early there about nesting, and I can just see the, the like excellent straw bedding underneath. Yeah, it's that's a vital component because even like right now, it's not in the thermal neutral zone or the optimal temperature mm. for calves, which in Ireland mm. it's, it's it's between ten and twenty five degrees, yeah. and you can see there how comfortable the calves are, and mm. um, you can't see their legs there on, with the level of nesting, um, and that's a, a really really important factor in controlling disease and in particular pneumonia in calves. Yeah, because I mean. The temperature last night was minus three around here and those calves, I mean, you said their optimal temperature is over 10, between 10 and 20 perhaps, uh, for calves less than, less than we say, three a week weeks. of age, three weeks of age. Yeah. So they accommodate, I mean, Connor feeds a little bit extra milk at this time to give them extra yeah. energy, but he also beds them very regularly and it's fantastic to see the way they nest. So they lose most of their heat through their feet mm -hmm. And now we can see that the calves are all nesting down. It's almost like a little duvet around their feet. And that's a very good, uh, um, it's a, you know, nice to see that. The other thing I like about this shed is that it's an old shed, but he ha the southwest is at this corner here. So Connor has allowed some air to come in over the top of the calves. 
So it's not at ground level, it's well over the calves and it's allowing that clear out. Um, and avoiding the drafts. Avoiding drafts. Which is vital as well. Yeah. yeah. So Connor, you suggest there's, you know, there's, do you think there are too many calves here or is that a, or what's your opinion at this time? Um, yeah, I think calf space is in and around the 1.7 meter squared per calf, um, yeah. which is, I think, just about okay. I wouldn't yeah. uh, like to go much more than that. And ideally, in the future, purpose-built calf housing is something we do in this farm, um, probably this summer, to yeah, relieve so some of this pressure. I think Connor was right to identify, though, as they get older, because you're going to have all that uh, urine, you're going to have the feces, and they're going to be maybe drinking milk, and it's going to be harder to keep this environment as it is now so you know and he suggested I think correctly that at that stage you might have to move groups on to different facilities or different houses is that a fair yeah. comment yeah that's yeah. what I'd probably do yeah is there also a slope in that shed there is there appears yeah. to be from here um, yeah I think it's a one in 20 slope from the back of the that's shed ideal. to the front yeah yeah, so that's allowing drainage and then I suppose yeah. you're going to get less ammonia build up and also they're not lying in that damp bedding as well, yeah. you know, which is, is, is vital. Yeah, and he's got the drinkers at the front as well. So that helps to prevent, if you like, extra, you know, uh, overspill or calves are going to urinate at the front of the pen rather than at the back of the pen. So, so there's some of the good aspects. And indeed, he's got some bales at the end here that he kind of, what's the purpose of them or when do you put um, those up? Just a windbreaker, um, and they're easy to move whenever we want to clean the shed out. We clean the shed out every two weeks, and we bed it roughly twice or three times a week, depending on when they need it. Yeah. Um, and bales are just a handy windbreaker that's easy to move. The calves seem to do well there. Very good. And so what other preventative strategies are implemented here on this farm against calf pneumonia? Um, well, we vaccinate, um, we vaccinate at anywhere from one day old to two weeks old. Uh, Frank will touch on that a bit more. He uh, does up a herd health plan for me each year. Yeah. So the, the, Connor has calves coming in here thick and fast. So to keep track of things, he uses the bovalus intranasal uh, vaccine that you can do the calves from a day old right up to maybe you know a week or 10 days old depending on 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 what's coming in so it means i think you're happy that the the pen is all completely done isn't that it connor That's yeah the they're in pens of 15 so um as a pen is full i vaccinate all calves in the pen so i can keep track of what is and isn't vaccinated as time goes on and that yeah. vaccine frank it's just important yeah. to to note that it covers two of the main viral culprits associated with viral pneumonia in young calves such as these here behind us uh, rsv and pi3 yeah I think the intranasal vaccines have been a game changer because we, we would have seen that uh, by calves were getting sicker with the pneumonia much earlier than we previously thought. So in unvaccinated herds, especially herds where stock were mixing or maybe buying in calves if they were feeding stress calves. Events. Yeah, the stress and then you, you'd find they're getting sick after two or three weeks of age. So by getting in earlier, you know, and the intranasal route is that localized protection where you're stimulating the localized immunity in the respiratory tract. So the calf is a ready-made defense, if you like, from a very young age. And, you know, not only do you not lose calves, but we know that there's such an impact on growth rates if you can keep that subclinical infection away. In other words, stop any bit of the lungs getting damaged, because that's going to affect the production of the calf at the end of the day. So that's worked for you kind of fairly well so far yeah I think. it seems to be working very well um, no major problems this year so far and I, I don't expect to have any more problems I think they have up to three months cover um, with right. the vaccine 12 weeks yeah so you're yeah. getting them through that high risk period yeah and, and, and optimizing their immunity essentially yeah. yeah and part of the plan I mean we see that at the end of the 12 weeks it, it's probably necessary to you know ex extend that cover and we have part of the vaccination plan Sarah would be that they're covered all through the summer then with with you know booster vaccinations and even into the previous uh, autumn and winter by pre-housing vaccination but so it's so it's a whole plan for the year and it, it's essentially um, I mean Connor doesn't have time really to deal with disease outbreaks is that fair yeah um we don't have a huge amount of labour on the farm, so any problems we can solve uh, before they happen yeah. um, is yeah. far better for us. Um, I'd always try and um, prevent a problem from happening rather than deal with it when it does happen. So uh, vaccinations are a big part of the plan on this farm. Yeah. Does that mean you're going to be playing f 
football again this year, Connor. Or, or <laughs> he's thinking about retirement, but uh, maybe <laughs> what? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> might play a bit. <laughs> oh, very good, very good. Okay. Connor, this year so far, thankfully, you haven't had any cases of pneumonia in calves. But Frank, if you're called out to uh, a bunch of calves or a batch of calves with the classical clinical, clinical signs of pneumonia, what are they that you see? Probably running temperatures if we check them. If we look at their, they probably have a nasal discharge and sometimes a crustiness in the eye. And then when we study the calf, you can see that little pant. Now, it's not very dramatic. And you certainly hear with the stethoscope, but you can see that little pant on the calf. So when we come across that situation, uh, we always make sure to check many calves in the pen because there's going to be certainly uh, one or two that are acutely affected, but there are others that maybe are incubating and then others that maybe have been through it, even a, with a, a subclinical infection. Now, when that happens, we might be forced to treat uh, with some anti-inflammatories and then use some maybe antibiotics if they're secondary invaders because that's, uh, you know, and we like to do some diagnostics. So we like to take some nasal swabs and, you know, send them off and see what are the respiratory pathogens involved. Um, so we normally send them to farm lab, but they do a PCR for, as you mentioned, the, the uh, RSV, PI3, but perhaps others like Mannheimia or you know, and mycoplasma these days as well. Yeah, and coronavirus as well, yeah. And you just mentioned there about the subclinical. I think it's yeah. important to the farmers are aware that the ones that you're called out to, they're only the tip of the iceberg, really, aren't they? In, in a batch of calves. Yeah, that, that's correct. So, in, you know, how many calves in per pen here, Connor? Uh, there's 15 calves per pen. 15. So, so if, for instance, we had some calves here affected or um, in, say four or five calves sick in that pen, I mean, we fully expect that there are others in that, that pen or the neighbouring pens to be affected. So, you know, we're not going to treat all the, the, the house, uh, but we certainly would have to treat some based on our, and then we would look at, you know, maybe what are the background causes, look at the ventilation again, look at the bedding again, and see, even look at our vaccination programme and see what else can happen there. And as well as that, we'd, we'd often go back to the, to the colostrum story because Connor looks fresh now, early March, but what's he going to be like maybe in, in the middle of April when, when you know, he's, he's another month of pressure and, you know, maybe the colostrum story has slipped a bit. So it's all about getting through that intense period and recognising in the second half of it is a real challenge. Yeah. And the infectious pressure could be increasing over that period it could, with the numbers. It, and it could do. And then, I mean, the, you mentioned the subclinical, but that's the great unknown. I mean, what impact does it have on those on that calf's product or, or lifetime production? I mean, it's 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 you know it's it's something worth considering, and even that alone is perhaps thinking about from a vaccination point of view or from a colostrum management point of view and so on. It's 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 the whole picture and it's the whole prevention. He hasn't time for big outbreaks of disease like this that could happen. He, as Connor says, it has to be a prevention basis for him to to enjoy his farming and to farm successfully that's what i would say yeah so we well recognize there's an impact on the calf in terms of sickness or even death then there's that subclinical story and i'm not you know so what impact does that have on the calf's lifetime production or you know what do you think Sarah? yeah well it's been shown that both clinical and subclinical they have massive yeah. repercussions for the long-term impact on productivity and ultimately profitability for the farmer at the end okay. of the day and okay. um, from a clinical point of view heifer calves that have one bout of respiratory disease in their first eight weeks of life um, will have a reduced yield in their first lactation up to mm. 525 litres and they'll also have a delay in the start in their first lactation mm. um, and from a beef point of view I think probably more interestingly is the subclinical cases can take 33 days longer to finish versus those with none and a clinical cases can take nearly two months longer to finish. Yeah, so so mm, as I said, it's massive impact on productivity. Yeah, so we, we've, we've, we've seen that in, in the summertime where uh, um, the 12 weeks cover now with the intranasal, but we need cover during the summer because these calves go to grass, there can be periods of pressure, weather related perhaps, uh, maybe nutrition related, uh, and that's why we're now inclined to cover the calf for the entire year rather than just that 12 week period. That's necessary. So our biggest call in the summertime is, you know, my calves are coughing, it's June, July. 
Is it lungworm or is it respiratory viruses? That's, that's, that's our big challenge. So we're intent to block off the respiratory viruses by say using the likes of Bovipast as a booster uh, through the summer and again possibly pre-housing. Equally we have to have that differential diagnosis of lungworm in the back of our mind. How can we manage that? You know, and we want to use the medicines, of course, appropriately and prudently, but not too often either. So Connor would, you know, part of his plan is to allow them get some exposure to lungworm and then, you know, um, intervene at the correct time. So that's that's the story. And I think as well, those coughing uh, animals during the summer, they can have co-infections. They could have lungworm present, but also viruses or, or bacteria uh, elements. That's right. And I mean, it used to be the case that all our lungworm cases happened at the end of July. So we'd be coming home from Leinster finals in Crow Park, having beaten the dubs. But now that's changing. I mean, it's, it's very much a September, October lungworm story. And uh, so, so and that's because of extended grazing, maybe even a bit of climate change, longer grazing seasons. But, you know, that RSV challenge needs to be managed throughout the summer. And, you know, so Connor would be, I mean, you're weighing your calves fairly regularly. And, and I think the point is that all the foundation for that platform, getting to breeding and production, is that you avoid uh, the problems here by the mixture of management, nutrition and vaccine. But, and it has to be said, the other advantage is this, Connor, is, you know, we, we're using less antibiotics on the farm. I mean, that's more and more important now. Absolutely, with antimicrobial resistance now. It's yeah. very topical and... Yeah, yeah, and the consumer wants that. You have yeah. to recognise that and, you know, calves are healthier too. The welfare is much better. I mean, look at those calves at the minute, they're just having their little sleep now after jumping around an hour ago, but it's lovely to see them. Yeah. You know, it's a pleasure to work with them. Um, and, you know, you'd find the stress of sick animals is not something you look forward to, Connor. is that fair? No, absolutely not. Um, there's nothing worse than coming and seeing animals not thriving and not doing well, so we try and avoid all those situations. Yeah. So it's really great to see your preventative strategies are working really, really well so far in, yeah. in, in the calving period. <laughs> Yeah, well, it's very early yet. Um, problems tend to crop up in April rather than March. But uh, yeah, hopefully, hopefully you get through it OK. Yeah, so I, I think that's a fair point. It's an evolving story. I mean, it's never the same. It's not something you can write a template for and have it for the year for every farmer. I mean, the, 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 the dynamic is important and that ongoing conversation is important between farmer and vet especially. So we can read what's happening, read the changes and manage them appropriately. Be that, be that through medicines or vaccines or through management practices. So, it's farm you know, specific, really. Ah, it is. Yeah, it and that's is. why it's important to engage with your own vet. Yeah, that, well, that, that's what we enjoy. I mean, the, it, it's much more the vet and the farmer. I think if a farmer doesn't want to be stressed with sick animals, uh, and the vet doesn't want to be treating too many clinicals either because the outcomes can be poor, and you want to avoid that. So it's a good story all around. To finish our discussion, we have a few questions from the audience. Um, so Frank, I'm going to ask you a few questions, if that's all right. Okay, that's fine. Um, so one of the questions is, are calves that have scour early in life more prone to getting respiratory disease or pneumonia? <sighs> yeah, I'd say the answer to that is yes. Uh, we often get co-infection, if you like, respiratory disease. And, and the reasons could be, I mean, it could be a common reason of maybe colostrum issues at the background of it all, you know, calves with diarrhea tend to the bed tends the bed tends to be wetter so you tend to have more risk factors for respiratory disease and also you have that immunosuppression that you get with with a scour so the answer would be yes you can get both together and it makes the management more difficult you know it means you have to manage uh, the sick calves and maybe isolate them and not let them spread disease as much and maybe attend to them with electrolytes and maybe even iv fluids so that's that's a common thing we have to deal with unfortunately yeah and another question from the audience is, in the face of an outbreak, can you vaccinate a batch of calves with pneumonia? Yeah, well, that's, that's, I mean, that's a key question because we never always, go, they're not always all healthy. So when we meet an outbreak, we certainly are very careful about the treating the sick calves 
But then we look at the cohorts and we say, look, it might be no harm to get in here with a, with a vaccine. The intranasal vaccine works very well there because of its quick onset. I mean, you've, if By you like, week. well, or less than a week. By the time you get a, you know, an immune response. So that's usually time enough to, to protect those other calves. So again, yes, we would use the intranasal vaccine, if you like, to ring fence in the cohorts. We're a little careful about using it on a sick calf because the data sheet would, would advise against that. Mm -hmm. You know, so we, it's, it's kind of on a judgment basis, essentially. Case by case. Case by case, yeah. Thanks very much, Connor, for having us here today and also for Frank uh, also here. And I appreciate it's a very, very busy time, both for farmers and vets. So uh, we're thankful for that. Thank you for tuning in to our second episode of our March Animal Health Series. And please join us next week for our series on coccidiosis in calves.